Good afternoon. Um, I'd first like to begin this uh, hearing by thanking our witnesses and thanks to my uh, co-chair, Senator Feinstein. We've been looking for a forum to have a hearing like this. As uh, in so many areas, it seems like we're putting the, the cart ahead of the horse and we now we'd really like to hear from the experts about what they can tell us about the public health consequences of marijuana use in the country. And so far this year, we've centered our efforts on uh, preventive uh, prevention of addictive sub substances from entering the country and infiltrating our communities. But now we want to talk about something a little different. As you know, a 2018 report by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration found that an estimated 43.5 million Americans used marijuana in the last year. The percentage of the population 12 years age and older currently using marijuana has increased in recent years from under 7% in 2010 to more than 10% in 2018. And while marijuana is still a prohibited drug under federal law, uh, more than 90% of the states allow for some medical use of marijuana in some capacity, and 10 states in the District of Columbia now allow for the recreational use of marijuana. Despite growing acceptance and accessibility of this drug and its derivatives, I believe we lack definitive evidence on the short and long-term health implications of marijuana use. That's especially true for vulnerable populations like uh, adolescents, pregnant women, and people suffering from mental health issues. Earlier this year, the, our, the Surgeon General, one of our witnesses here today, issued an advisory that highlighted the risks of marijuana use for pregnant and nursing women and adolescents. I remain concerned about the lack of evidence re from regarding health risks of these groups as well as the general population. And it may be helpful at some point for the witnesses to discuss what type of evidence um, that the medical community considers um, conclusive or at least uh, solid enough to make a, a policy determination on uh, because there seems to be a lot of folk uh, myths and other idiosyncratic ideas that really haven't gone through the sort of peer review and published uh, requirements that most scientific evidence has to go through in order to be accepted by policymakers. In 2017, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine published one of the most comprehensive studies on the research of the health effects of recreational and therapeutic use of marijuana and cannabis-derived products. It included nearly 100 conclusions. They found conclusive or substantial evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids, but not necessarily marijuana or marijuana-derived cannabinoids, are an effective treatment for chronic pain chemotherapy-induced nausea, and vomiting. However, they found insufficient or no evidence regarding potential therapeutic effects of cannabis or cannabinoids for a variety of health conditions considered. Additionally, they found substantial evidence that marijuana use had increased the risk of motor vehicle crashes, the development of schizophrenia and other psychoses, and complications in pregnancy like lower birth weight. It's critical for people like Senator Feinstein and I and other policymakers to understand the public safety implications of increased marijuana use before we dive in to the admittedly complex and difficult job of, um, of changing federal policy. In 2018, the Food and Drug Administration approved the first drug with an active ingredient derived from marijuana to treat rare, severe forms of epilepsy. It was only after rigorous studies and a thorough review by the FDA that physicians can have confidence in the safety, efficacy, and consistency of that drug. All this is to say that there are so many questions that still need to be answered. The Surgeon General, Dr. Volkov, and the experts on our second panel will help shed light on what science tells us about the public health risks of marijuana and what we still need to learn. I look forward to hearing the testimony and discussing how we can work to prevent youth access to marijuana and properly evaluate the safety and efficacy of any therapies that may utilize <coughs> marijuana and cannabinoids. 
Let me now turn the floor over to my co-chairman, Senator Feinstein, for any opening remarks she'd care to make. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. As you know, I very, enjoy very much working with you, so this is a pleasure. Uh, the point of today's hearing is to better understand marijuana's impact on public health, and so I thank you very much for holding it. Um, one thing I've learned is that marijuana is much more complex than I thought. Um, it apparently contains hundreds of different, of com different compounds, all of which produce different effects. And I'm told that much of what we know about marijuana is anecdotal, which of course is problematic for us in terms of making policy. It's problematic for medical professionals in knowing how to treat it, and it's problematic for consumers when they use it. And I'm told this is due in part to the fact that marijuana status as a Schedule I drug makes it difficult to research. It's my belief that science should inform our policy. And that's why I, along with Senator Grassley and others, introduced the Cannabidiol and Marijuana Research Expansion Act, which would remove barriers to research. The NIH recently increased the number of grants awarded to study marijuana, and I hope it will continue to do so. This will enable marijuana's potential therapeutic benefits really to be more understood as, as they are explored. Um, it's important that we learn more about appropriate dosing and delivery mechanisms. It's important that we learn how marijuana components interact with other medications, how, how long-term use impacts the body. It's my understanding that the limited existing research has found varying degrees of evidence that components of marijuana may effectively treat conditions like intractable epilepsy, chemotherapy-induced nausea, I know that for a fact from family uh, issues, and vomiting, muscle spasticity, chronic pain, and short-term sleep disturbances. The Food and Drug Administration has approved four marijuana-derived drugs to treat many of these illnesses. Despite the potential benefits, it's equally important to understand its adverse effects. For instance, studies show that marijuana can have a negative impact on the developing brain. This is one thing I hope to hear a little more about, including decreased cognitive abilities, loss of IQ, and increased um, risk of psychosis. I'm going to end here, Mr. Chairman, in the interest of seeing, of listening to our um, panel, and uh, I'll put my remarks in the record. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> our first witness is Vice Admiral Jerome Adams, who serves as the 20th Surgeon General of the United States. During his tenure as Surgeon General, Dr. Adams has created several initiatives to tackle our nation's most, pre most pressing health issues, including the opioid epidemic, oral health and the links between community health and both economic prosperity and national security. The Surgeon General issued an advisory in August of this year on the potential health effects of marijuana use for adolescent <coughs> brain development and use by pregnant mothers. Our second witness in the, on the first panel is Dr. Nora Volkov, who served as director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, or NIDA, since May 2003. That's quite a, quite a run. As a research psychiatrist and scientist, Dr. Volkov pioneered the use of brain imaging to investigate the toxic effects and addictive properties of abusable drugs. If I could ask each of you to uh, limit your opening statement to about five minutes, and then we'll make your uh, complete statement part of the record, and then we can engage in some uh, questions and answers. That would, be, that would be great. So let me turn to you, Dr. Adams, to, to start, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Cornyn, Co-Chairwoman uh, Feinstein, and members of the caucus. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share my recent marijuana advisory with you and to join national experts to discuss a complex issue that I feel demands our attention and our action. As you mentioned, in August 2019, I issued a Surgeon General's advisory on marijuana use in the developing brain, emphasizing the importance of protecting our nation from the health risks of marijuana use in adolescence and during pregnancy. I did this in response to alarming rates of marijuana use among pregnant women and young people, 
widespread and growing access to increasingly potent marijuana through legalization at the state level, and mounting evidence that marijuana use poses a risk to healthy brain development and to public health. As Surgeon General, I've visited with communities and clinicians in places like California and Colorado, Georgia and Texas, Nevada and Oklahoma. And as a former state health commissioner myself, I've spoken with health department leaders across the country, my friends, many of them reluctant overseers of an enormous and poorly informed national public health experiment. Over and over I hear great and escalating concern about the rapid normalization of marijuana use and the impact that a false perception of its safety is having on our communities and specifically our young people and our moms-to-be. As you mentioned, sir, as of today, 33 states in the District of Columbia have legalized marijuana in some way. I'll say it again, we're conducting a massive public health experiment on our citizenry. And with greater legalization, young people are reporting a decline in perceived harmfulness of the drug. In 2018, only a third of adolescents said they thought weekly marijuana use was harmful. Marijuana is now the third most commonly used illicit substance in adolescents behind alcohol and e-cigarettes. Last year, over 9 million 12 to 25 year olds reported marijuana use, and each day, 3,700 adolescents become new marijuana users. Unfortunately, the scary truth is that while the perceived harm of marijuana is decreasing, the potential for harm is actually increasing due to widespread access, increased potency, and multiple forms. Marijuana is now everywhere, especially in states that have legalized, and it can be smoked, drunk, eaten, and vaped. As I like to say, this ain't your mama's marijuana. Not enough people know that today's marijuana is far more potent than in days past. The amount of THC has increased threefold in commonly cultivated plants over the last few decades, and dispensary products are often much stronger. Edibles, oils, and waxes can deliver unpredictable concentrations of THC, often of 70% or more. This is important because the higher the THC concentration, the higher the risk to our young people. Across the country, we've seen increased emergency department visits for psychosis and for non-fatal overdose. And the early and more often a person uses marijuana, especially at these higher THC levels, the greater the peril. Nearly one in five people who begin marijuana usage during adolescence will become addicted. Yes, you can become addicted to marijuana. Science tells us frequent marijuana usage during adolescence can impair a child's attention, memory, and decision making. And young people who regularly use marijuana are more likely to show a decline in IQ and school performance, are more likely to drop out, and are even more likely to attempt suicide. In pregnant women, marijuana is actually the most commonly used illicit substance. Between 2002 and 2017, marijuana use among pregnant women doubled. Marijuana usage during pregnancy can not only affect the baby's brain, but also can result in lower birth weight, a marker for early death and disability. And that's why that's so important. The Colorado PRAM study revealed a 50% increase in low birth weight in marijuana using moms. THC is transmitted via breast milk, meaning the risk continues even after delivery. And finally, marijuana and tobacco smoke share some of the same harmful components, so no one should smoke either product around a baby. We already know a lot about the harms and potential harms of marijuana use on the developing brain, but I'll be the first to admit we need to know more. We need to better understand the long-term health consequences of prenatal and youth exposure to marijuana, as well as strategies to decrease harms. But I want you to hear me say this, we know enough now to deliver sound guidance to protect the future of our nation's youth. My advisory includes resources to help parents, teachers, clinicians, and others safeguard our youth from harm, but it will take all of us using the best evidence and communicating it clearly to ensure a healthy future for our young people. This advisory was carefully written based on the best currently available science with input from NIDA, SAMHSA, CDC, FDA, ACOG, AAP, and others. So please go to surgeongeneral.gov and share it. I'll finish by saying my bottom line to you today is this. No amount of marijuana use during pregnancy or adolescence is known to be safe. Therefore, communities must consider and should not minimize the short and long-term public health impacts of marijuana use. Thank you again for the opportunity to share this important information and for your support in promoting healthy fetal and adolescent development to protect the youth of America. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Volkov. 
Good afternoon. Thanks very much for having me here, our Chairman Corning and Co-Chairman Feinstein, and for holding this here on marijuana. Um, it's an opportunity for us to bring to you what we are funding at the National Institute on, on Drug Abuse, what type of research we're funding to try to clarify the effects of marijuana in the young brain. As you mentioned, in 2018, there were 43.5 million people who reported use of marijuana in the past year, making it the most commonly used illicit drug in the United States, and its use is increasing. Marijuana exerts its effects by activating cannabinoid receptors, which are part of our endogenous cannabinoid system that modulates multiple physiological processes in our brains and body. This system emerges early in gestation when it plays a critical role in helping to orchestrate brain development, which is why exposure to marijuana during early development can impact the function of the brain later in life. THC, the component of marijuana responsible for its intoxicating and addictive effects, freely crosses the placenta. Fetal exposure is associated with significant negative outcomes, including fet fetal growth restriction, lower birth weight, and preterm delivery. Research is ongoing to clarify the mechanisms through which it contributes to these effects and to investigate the effects of marijuana to the fetal brain when used by itself or when combined with teratogenic drugs, such as alcohol and nicotine. Adolescents, whose brains are also undergoing major developmental changes, are also particularly vulnerable to the negative effects of marijuana. Preclinical studies of, the, of THC exposure during adolescence have shown greater subsequent sensitivity to the rewarding effects of other drugs, which could be one reason why those who use marijuana at a young age are more vulnerable to addiction later in life, not just to marijuana, but also to other drugs. Epidemiological studies have found repeatedly that kids who regularly consume marijuana have lower academic achievement and a higher risk of dropping out of school. Brain imaging studies have shown that frequent marijuana use during adolescence is associated with structural and functional changes in areas of the brain necessary for attention, memory, emotions, and motivation, which might account for the adverse cognitive and behavioral effects associated with youth marijuana use. The association between marijuana use and mental illness is another area of major concern, particularly in light of the higher content of THC in today's marijuana. Serious mental illnesses and suicides are on the rise in our country. And while multiple factors are likely contributing to this rise, it is imperative to understand if exposure to high potency cannabis in adolescents is one of them. High potency marijuana can trigger acute psychotic episodes, which is one of the main causes for emergency department visits associated with cannabis use, which are also rising. While most of these episodes are short lasting, they can become chronic. Multiple studies, though not all, have associated adolescent marijuana use with an overall risk for an early onset of chronic psychosis such as schizophrenia. Adolescent marijuana use is also associated with increased risk of suicidal behavior. Many of the studies done to assess the effects of adolescent marijuana use have been criticized because of certain limitations. For example, some of them may have not controlled for other factors that affect adolescent brain development. Some may have had insufficient sample sizes. Most of them were conducted at a time when THC content in marijuana was much lower. To address these shortcomings, NIDA is leading two major study, studies. One is the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development, or ABCD study, which is the largest long-term study of brain development and child health in the United States. The study has recruited over 11,000 children aged 9 to 10 who will be followed into early adulthood to investigate how the brain develops and how its development is affected by substance use, including marijuana. The other one, which complements the ABCD study is the Healthy Brain Child Development, or HBCD study, which is part of the NIH KILL initiative and is currently in its pilot phase. This study would establish a large cohort of pregnant women and their infants to assess the child's brain cognitive and emotional development longitudinally 
over the course of the first 10 years of their lives. Findings will help researchers develop standards for more normal brain development in childhood and to characterize the long-term impact of prenatal and postnatal drug exposure, exposures. Ensuring normal brain development is fundamental for achieving a person's full potential, which is why we owe it to the future generations to protect them from the potentially disruptive effects of cannabis to their brains and well-being. Thanks very much, and I look forward for your, to your questions. I'm struck, Dr. Adams, by your description as a poorly informed national health experiment with regard to marijuana. And of course, part of what we're trying to do today is have a better informed uh, discussion about uh, this national health experiment. Um, I see some parallels, perhaps, and I'd be interested in your commentary on this, to what we learned about tobacco in the decades in the past. I even went back uh, with my staff's help and found some advertisements by the tobacco industry where they would tout the health benefits of smoking. And uh, not only were those not proven, um, using the sort of peer-reviewed evidence um, scholar scholarship that we would expect, but there was not uh, disclosure of the negative, the detriment uh, to, to health, things like addiction to nicotine, uh, lung cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, and the like. And I feel like there's some parallels, perhaps, here in, in the way we are uh, wading into this debate. Uh, do you think that's uh, analogous, Dr. Adams and Dr. Volkov, or is, that, uh, is, it, is it different? Well, sir, thank you for saying that, because uh, as the Surgeon General, I want every policy decision to have as much science infused into it as possible, and you are correct. Uh, we've seen this play before. Uh, we've seen it with a number of substances. Once upon a time, cocaine was thought to be an effective medicine and harmless. Uh, once upon a time, opioids were thought to be good for whatever ails you and uh, to not have any harmful effects and no higher dosage limit. And not that I am in any way, shape, or form comparing marijuana to those substances, but from a policy point of view, I think the lesson we should have learned was that we have to make sure the science is leading the policy and that the tail isn't wagging the dog. And many of the indications that people are using marijuana for are unproven. We are overstating the benefits, and in my opinion, we are downplaying the risk and that is why I put out my advisory, because one risk we cannot afford to ignore is the risk to our pregnant women and our young people, our nation's future. Dr. Volkov? Yeah, I will completely agree. And I, I do want to state also the other aspect that we are learning with this, uh, with the use of marijuana at very high content, is we are finding out medical negative effects that we did not know existed. For example, a perfect example is the hyperemesis syndrome, where people that take high content THC chronically develop a syndrome where they cannot stop vomiting with very, very intense abdominal pain. This was not described until 2006. And again, we had never seen it because we did not get exposed to this type of marijuana. And so my concern relates to the fact that if we are not looking at something, particularly as we, for example, are discussing the use of marijuana in pregnancy, if we do not evaluate the outcome in these infants, we will not be able to understand what could be potentially very negative effects. And that, that is illustrated also with, with tobacco and nicotine. We did not know that smoking during pregnancy could have such negative effects until we studied it. And I'm so glad you have someone on the second panel uh, who's an expert on MVAs. There's this big misbelief out there that marijuana makes you a better driver, but the Colorado data shows us that MVAs went up, fatal MVAs went up, uh, in Colorado involving marijuana usage. And again, going back to young people, uh, I've got a teenager who's about to drive. The chips are already stacked against him. And we know that just statistically speaking. The last thing we want is for these young people to think that marijuana use is safe or heaven forbid that it actually will make them a better and more relaxed driver and lose even more of our teenagers on the roads now than what we already are. I know much of your testimony so far has focused on um, adolescents, uh, pregnant women, 
and people with other, um, the other conditions maybe make them more vulnerable. But are you suggesting by inference that marijuana consumption for a consenting adult who's otherwise healthy is, uh, is harm-free? Well, in general of the United States, the first thing I would say is absolutely not. Uh, there are plenty of substances out there which adults can uh, partake of that are not only not harm-free, but which my office has a long history of trying to uh, rein the horse back in on. And you mentioned tobacco. Alcohol is one of the top killers of folks in our country. I think that, again, we need to learn from our mistakes and be careful about normalization of behavior. Uh, one of the other dangers about marijuana usage uh, is that we don't know what we don't know. And so we don't want to conduct this experiment on our, on our citizenry, and that's adults and young people. But we know enough about young people to take action now, and that's why I focused my efforts and my attention in that space at this point in time. But, but again, sir, I don't want anyone to mistake what I'm saying as, uh, as implying that these products are considered safe for general adult usage. I, let me ask you about research, because you've both uh, referred to studies that have been done. Are there impediments, legal or otherwise, to the study of the health effects of marijuana in place? Um, I'll start off just by saying that Secretary Azar, um, the President, and I have all set, stated publicly we need to make it easier to do research. And there is and steps. What do we need to do to make that happen? Well, uh, HHS is partnering with DEA. Um, we're going around the country and talking to folks to find out barriers that exist to research. One of the things that uh, has been announced within the past month was uh, DEA making more strains of marijuana available so that folks can test more than just uh, the, uh, the, the, from the one facility in Mississippi where you could you, uh, typically get strains from. But Dr. Volkoff is an expert in this area and NIDA is intimately involved in the research process, so I would turn it over to her. The part, uh, part of the problem relies on the fact that marijuana is a Schedule one, and as such, if you want to do research on a Schedule one, you have to get a, re a DEA registration that can take, if you are lucky, one year to obtain, and that delays the process enormously. And every time that you make a change in your protocol, that also has to be submitted, and you have to wait for that, that to be approved. So it's a very lengthy on the, on the ability to get the, the research going. And then once you're going, right now, the only source for marijuana that is available in our country is that that we provide through a contract to, the, to Missouri, to the farm in Missouri. So if you as a researcher are interested on a particular strain of marijuana, you come to us at NIDA, it's probably unlikely that we have it and we'll have to cultivate it. So the process also is very slow there. And, and finally, to the other component that makes it very difficult is that we're interested in understanding what people are taking out there. I mean, in the States, they are legalizing marijuana and there are these dispensaries. And the varieties are very distinct. And so we don't know the difference between this or that. This product is being sold, telling that this has these characteristics. We cannot fund research that relates to co products that are actually being bought through these dispensaries because it's illegal. So we've been working for the past, I would say, several years with DEA to try to come with an accommodation that would allow researchers to streamline the process so that they can work on, on, on understanding both potentially negative, but also potentially therapeutic effects of uh, cannabis. Well, I know Senator Feinstein mentioned some legislation that she's working on with Senator Grassley uh, on the impediments to research, but that's perhaps something that we could, uh, we could work on together. Oh, great. Well, so, I, can I give a shout out to Senator uh, Feinstein? Uh, I'm not allowed. Absolutely. To, I'm not allowed to uh, endorse or comment on pending legislation, but I was doing my homework, and uh, you and uh, and Senator Grassley made a statement in the introduction of your of your uh, of your uh, legislation. You said medical treatment should be based on sound science, and those who are sick deserve safe medications that have been proven effective. I could not agree with that more. And I think it's very important that uh, folks such as yourself are acknowledging that and spreading that word. Thank you. Senator Feinstein. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And thank you 
<coughs> excuse me, I have a little throat problem. I'm a doctor, I can help you with that. <coughs> I may come to you. Um, as I understand, in investigations are ongoing. Uh, to date, nearly 1,500 lung injuries have been associated with the use of e-cigarettes and vaping products, with I 33 confirmed deaths. THC has been present in most of the tested samples of these cases. Here's the question. Do we have enough research to understand the potential impacts of using e-cigarettes and vaping devices to consume marijuana products? What is the situation, and what happens to the lung when you use it? Um, thank you for that question. This is something I'm terribly concerned about, and that HHS is really mounting an all-hands-on-deck response to. We have stood up our emergency operations center at CDC. We're working with state and local health departments to get information in as quickly as possible. And you summarized it correctly, ma'am. Uh, a large number of these cases have been associated with vaping THC, particularly THC that's been obtained through the black market. Explain what happens when you do this. Uh, ma'am, well, as an anesthesiologist, I can tell you, um, God didn't mean for much of anything besides oxygen to go into your lungs. And when you aerosolize oil and then suck it into your lungs and let it reaccumulate on the lining of your lungs, it can cause all sorts of bad things to happen. Uh, and uh, I'll also tell you one of the big problems is uh, we don't know what's in these, uh, uh, these, these pods. Uh, a lot of them are made on the black market, and the ones that are even uh, made through, quote, legitimate sources, we don't know all that, that's contained in them. And it's why last December I put out a Surgeon General's advisory warning about the epidemic rise in vaping among young people a 78% increase in vaping amongst students. And I pointed out at the time that uh, a third of young people who were vaping had reported vaping marijuana. So I would say to you, before I turn it over to Dr. Volkoff, that uh, number one, the FDA and the CDC advise against vaping products containing THC. Number two, we advise not to modify or add any substances such as THC or other oils to products purchased in stores. And uh, to, finally, no amount of marijuana usage during pregnancy or adolescence, no matter how it enters the body, is known to be safe, and no pregnant woman or young person should be vaping. Dr. Volkov? Be, could I ask you a question? Have uh, autopsies been done on the lungs of the 33 confirmed deaths? Do we know what happens to the lungs? Uh, Ma'am, uh, what I would say is that, uh, and again, I used to run a State Department of Health in Indiana, and one of the challenges is these investigations start at a local level. And a lot of times the decisions about which samples are going to be collected and which autopsies are going to be done are made before the State Department of Health is even alerted. And then the CDC finds out after that. So one of the big things that we're trying to help people understand is that we have to have a high index of suspicion. We've got to ask the right questions. And we should be doing an autopsy on all of these So cases. autopsies have not been done? On some of them, but not all of them, ma'am. On some of them? Yes. Well, what's been learned uh, from the autopsies what happens to the lungs? Uh, we know that there, there is damage to the cells of the lungs, to the tissues of the lungs. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Some of these cases had been reported to be associated with vitamin E, and uh, that was the case for some. But it actually looks, it's an inflammatory injury. Uh, it, it, it's, it's almost... Um, trying to think of a, a good comparison. But uh, again, it, it's, it's as if the cells... Enough the to cause death. Oh, absolutely, ma'am. Um, uh, lipoid pneumonia has been found in some of these folks, but in other folks, it's a, as if the cells and the tissue are being eaten away. Again, you're putting toxic materials into the lungs that were never meant to be inhaled. Dr. Volkov? Yeah, just basically, in medical school, they teach you that you should never, ever allow lipids to get into the lungs because they produce a very massive inflammatory reaction. So that's, and since you require the lungs to function properly to, for uh, oxygen to be transferred, this is probably one of the reasons why it has had such negative effects. But I think it is also highlighting how we are approving these technologies in ways without recognizing what their negative effects yes. are. And you are highlighting the acute effects. But for example, we don't know what may be the effects on the function of the lung long term in those cases that you don't see this acute presentation. Well, let me ask this question. Do are vaping devices well enough known? It, do they bring on death? 
Well, that with they, the, it, as it goes into the lungs, if you use how to ask this question, if you use a vaping device, are you more apt to die? Not necessarily if you are using a device that has quality control. And for example, one of the things that we have done at NIDA is to develop a standard electronic cigarette that can be used to determine whether for people that cannot stop smoking, the use of these vaping devices can help them actually be able to protect them from the negative effect of combustible tobacco. So provided that you have standards of quality and you that. control both the device as well as the cartridges that you're using and the content of nicotine and the products, this device could be given uh, as a therapeutic option for those that cannot stop smoking. And can I answer that question in another way, yes. ma'am? Even the people who are advocates for e-cigarettes and vaping devices describe them as harm reduction. Less harm does not mean harm less. No young person, no pregnant woman, no person who is not currently smoking should even entertain using these devices because, again, you're taking substances that are in an unknown pod and you're vaporizing them and taking them back into the lungs. And whether that's marijuana or anything else out there, uh, again, we don't know what we don't know, but we know that those, those substances were never intend, intended to go into your lungs and they can be toxic. Yeah, I have particular concern about marijuana use by very young children and the fact that reports have shown that it uh, results in a decline in IQ, in poor school performance, and higher rates of school absences. How prevalent is this? Do you want, well, let, let me take that at the 30,000 foot level and then kick it to Dr. Volkoff. It's important for us to understand, uh, and a lot of folks say, well, I smoked a joint or I smoked marijuana back in the, uh, back in the 80s, back in the 70s, uh, the potency is much, much higher. Higher THC content equals more danger. Number two, it, it just uh, not everyone is going to have the same effect. Every person is different, and so some people, uh, as we know, some people uh, uh, smoke, a, smoke for five years and get lung cancer, and some people smoke for 50 years and don't get lung cancer. But if you're talking about a child, you wanna give that child, I have three young kids, the best chance at life. Yes. And we know that on a population level, that the cumulative effects of having an entire population, nine million young people using marijuana products is going to be a net negative for our country. But do you wanna get into uh, specifics, Dr. Volkov? Yeah, I will just point out, I mean, one, it's not surprising in a way because this endogenous cannabinoid system, one of the things that it does, it modulates uh, the activation of neuronal networks. So when you are yeah, hyper-stimulated, it brings it down. When you are hyper-inhibited, it brings it up to create a certain window of optimal function. So if you are taking marijuana, in a way you are filtering many of those stimuli and your development is dependent on those stimuli to actually create the final architecture. So Tell in a way, me, how it, does marijuana impact school performance? What does it do to the brain? The, the simplest one, it interferes with memory and learning. Someone that is stoned cannot remember, and that's not just adolescent, that's that. any adult. And as a result of that, if you are a student and your job is to learn and marijuana stays in the body for a long time, you're going to have a long lasting effect in your capacity to memorize, you will fail school. And that is without addressing the possibility that is marijuana- Is the memory loss permanent? That's a question that there is controversy. There is some evidence that long lasting impairment in memory and attention by some studies and others show that after several months it recovers. And we don't re that's one of the reasons why we're doing the ABCD study, to actually unequivocally determine if long-term use of marijuana will produce uh, long-lasting or irreversible changes in memory, attention, and other process of cognition. Wow. Is it because marijuana today is stronger, the THC factor? That's not going to help at all. The content is much, much higher. And the higher the content, that's actually it's threefold higher overall, and there are problems. Wait, 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 I'm not trying to under, three times higher the content than of when? Than 2002. Really? Yes. Ma'am, there was a study uh, that, that looked at marijuana from 1995 till, uh, till 2014, and they saw that marijuana in 1995, the average strains were about 4.5% THC. The average strains in 2014 were uh, about 12%. So that's, See, that's where we get the three times yeah. number. But it's important to remember now that dispensaries 
have marijuana, that it's testing at about 20, 25%. So that would be five times stronger than 1995. And then when you put it into oils and waxes, you can get 70, 80, 90% THC. So I hate comparisons, but something that I say to folks that tends to resonate is that's like the difference between having a light beer in 1995 and drinking a pint of vodka today. It is literally that See, much of a difference in I concentration. I don't think people know that. I don't think they do either, ma'am. How do we get that out? Well, uh, again, Surgeon General is advising <clears throat> you. We need you all to help share it. SurgeonGeneral.gov. Please let people know this ain't your mother's marijuana. And the other problem that it's confounded is that when you go and buy a product, you don't actually know what the content of 9-THC yeah. is. And this particularly becomes problematic when you get an edible, you get a chocolate and you don't know the content. And so you don't know how much to take. And, and one of the reasons why people end up in an emergency room admission with a psychotic episode, because the content is so high. Well, it, now, how big a problem is this? In terms of emergency department you know, admission? The high content of hallucinogenic quality in marijuana today versus 10, excuse me, 10, 15 years ago. It's very problematic, <laughs> and studies have consistently shown, for example, that investigate the negative effects of marijuana, that the higher the content of 9-THC, the greater the likelihood that you will have a psychotic episode. The greater the likelihood, actually, the risk associated with schizophrenia. Which changes the nature of belief about marijuana, because most people that I know believe it's relatively harmless. And what you're saying is it is not today, that it's, it's much stronger and that it's much more volatile. Exactly, and uh, Dr. Volkoff is an expert and speaks on the, uh, the effects on the individual, and she's, uh, again, spoke of her, her wonderful brain imaging studies. I tend to look at the population level, and the, the metrics we look at are Motor vehicle accidents going up. Uh, emergency department admissions going up. From marijuana use, you can prove that? Yes, ma'am. The emergency department admissions have gone up for, uh, for accidental ingestions and for people showing up with psychosis. Um, we're seeing all sorts of untoward effects from marijuana usage, again, particularly in, in, uh, in young people. But uh, the real concerning population health trends related to marijuana usage. Could you provide us with some information? Me, we, we may want to put out a paper as a result of this, sure. and that might be one of the well, findings that, that we would discuss. And uh, I know that's been one of the functions of this caucus in the past, is to issue reports or papers that, uh, on different topics, and certainly that's something we ought to consider because doing. Because I have young people in my family, and you know, you'd think it's all nothing. Right. Hopefully they don't use it, but they sure can talk about it. Yeah. So um, I, I think it, if, if what you, I'm understanding what you're saying, the potential danger of marijuana has gone up rather dramatically in the last 10, 15 years. The, the potential danger has gone up while the perceived harm of the product has gone down. And I, what I was quoting yeah, in my yes. opening statement was NISDA data that, looks at, that, that surveys young people uh, from SAMHSA. SAMHSA data that surveys young people and asks them their perception of the dangers of marijuana and their perceptions of danger yep. are going down, uh, particularly in states that have legalized because they see it all around them, while the actual risk, um, both from a scientific point of view and on a population health level, is going up. What has California done? Uh, well, you've got someone from the California uh, Cannabis Research uh, Commission, who's going to be on the second panel. Oh, good. And I've been out there. I've visited UC Davis. I've visited UCSD. I've been to the LA County Health Department. I will tell you that all of the health officials I've spoken to are terribly concerned about the spike in pregnant women who are using. We've seen a doubling in pregnant women who report using marijuana, and they're concerned about the number of young people. It's causing disciplinary problems in schools, and we don't know what the long-term health effects are going to be. So when in your state, ma'am, right. very concerned. So just quickly, how is it more concentrated, more volatile than it used to be? The plant itself, I mean, you actually, like biology, you can uh, determine the content of, of the active ingredients by breeding up varieties that have higher content. And that's how they have come up with plants that have higher and higher content, manipulating it. And, and now, with the use of resins, you can extract the active ingredient and put it in a cartridge, and that oh, can dear. deliver even higher content. 
So this is just a basically genetic, what the agricultural business has been doing to try to improve on the quality of the plants. So we should not regard it as harmless. Oh, it's, it's not harmless at all. And, I, and when you were asking about your own state, there was actually, they were showing me the data on emergency departments in one of the main uh, hospitals in San Diego where they basically will have an eight-fold increase in emergency admissions oh from the cannabis over a period of eight years. Eight-fold. It's gigantic. This so, is a baby's. This is not just vaping. This oh, is I thought some, you said smoking and edibles and every single way of administering cannabis. So, well, if a mother uses it, this strong stuff, while she's pregnant, will that impact? She the can child? become psychotic herself. High content THC. What people don't realize is high content <clears throat> marijuana with very high THC can trigger a, an acute psychotic episode, and that leads you to the emergency department. It's a horrible experience. What if she's pregnant? What does it do to the unborn child? Well, you have there, the, the, on top of the negative effects to the mother, the fact that the marijuana will go into the fetus and affect the brain of the fetus. The fetus cannot complain, right? Right. But it is going to actually very likely be interfering. Imagine that there is this very precise process by which your brain determines when this neuron migrates here, when this neuron divides, when this neuron interconnects with another. And that is modulated by your own endogenous cannabinoid system. When you artificially stimulate that system, you're basically disrupting all of that perfect orchestration. That's why we have so much concern about the use of marijuana among pregnant women, children, and adolescents. Can a baby be born addicted to marijuana? I do not know of any description of a baby uh, having been born addicted to marijuana, but what we do know is that babies can become, be born sedated because of the use of marijuana, particularly during the last trimester. But it's the definition of, of a baby that's born addicted, that has not been something that has been documented. And, and ma'am, something that, again, I was just in your state uh, two weeks ago talking about were the infant mortality rates. We know one of the predictors of infant mortality is low birth weight. Well, I was shocked when I saw the Colorado PRAMS data that showed that women who smoke marijuana have a 50% increased chance of having a baby born at low birth weight. And so that's another thing that people don't think about when they are prescribing marijuana to women who are pregnant or could be could becoming pregnant. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to stop there with the first panel because we, got, we obviously have a lot of questions and uh, we want to continue the conversation, but we want to get to the second panel too. So uh, thank you, Dr. Adams, Dr. Volkoff, for your contribution. And believe me, we want to continue the conversation because as you can see, Senator Feinstein and I, and I'm sure our other colleagues who couldn't be here today have a lot of, a lot of questions and I think the American people deserve uh, the facts, which is what we're trying to get to here. So. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll invite the second panel to come forward and get situated, and we'll get started. In and just Senator, we're happy to submit any information you need about the harms of marijuana usage that we've collected. Please share my advisory, surgeongeneral.gov. We need to get the word out to folks that this is not some harmless product out there. We'll thank do that. You, thank you. And thanks for doing the hearing. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much. Uh, our second panel includes experts who've conducted research on various aspects of public health and marijuana use. First, Dr. Robert Fitzgerald, currently serves as a professor in the Department of Pathology at the University of California, San Diego, where he is also the director of toxicology laboratory, director of the toxicology laboratory and associate director of the clinical chemistry laboratory. He's board certified in toxicology and clinical chemistry by the American Board of Cl Clinical Chemistry, and his research, Senator Feinstein, focuses on marijuana-impaired driving. And I know you had questions about that. Dr. Stacy Gruber is director of the Cognitive and Clinical Neuroimaging Corps and the Marijuana Investigations for Neuroscientific Discovery Program, otherwise called the MIND Program, both housed at the Harvard-affiliated Psychiatric Hospital in Belmont, Massachusetts, McLean Hospital. She's also an associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Her research focuses on cognitive development and the effects of marijuana's major constituent compounds. Dr. Sean Hennessy is professor of epidemiology in biostatistics at the University of Pennsylvania's Perl Perlman School of Medicine. Dr. Hennessy conducts research in the field of pharma, pharmacoepidemiology, that's a mouthful, which is the study of the health effects of drugs and other medical products in populations. Dr. Hennessy is a past scientific chair and past president of the International Society for Pharmacoepidemiology and has served as the FDA's Drug Safety and Risk Management Advisory, served on that committee the Drug Safety and Risk Management Advisory Committee for the FDA. Dr. Hennessy contributed to the National Academies of Science 2017 study on marijuana's health effects. And finally, Dr. Madeline Meyer is the Assistant Professor of Psychology at Arizona State University and Postdoctoral Fellow with support from the Duke University Transdisciplinary Prevention Research Center. Her research interests involve adolescent marijuana use as well as the health effects of marijuana concentrates. So obviously um, there's a lot of interest in what you have to say. If I could first recognize Dr. Fitzgerald and ask each of you maybe to speak for about five minutes and then maybe be open to some questions, your written remarks will be made part of the record without further ado. So Dr. Fitzgerald. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Feinstein, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today to discuss uh, issues related to marijuana and driving. As a way of brief introduction, my first job out of graduate school was as a forensic toxicologist for the state of Virginia, where I helped uh, work with the medical examiner to determine the cause and manner of death uh, in medical examiner's cases. At the ME's office, I saw the devastating effects of driving under the influence on a routine basis. I also had the opportunity to work with both state and local uh, law officers, along with prosecution and defense, to present scientific data in courts of law. Currently, I'm a clinical toxicologist at UC San Diego, where my research focuses on developing analytical methods to measure concentrations of THC and metabolites following recent marijuana exposure. I'm part of a large team of investigators at the University of California, San Diego Center for Medical Cannabis Research focus on understanding both beneficial and detrimental effects of cannabis on human health. We recently completed enrolling subjects in one of the largest studies to date, looking at the effect of smoked marijuana on driving performance and are in the initial stages of analyzing this data. The relationship between marijuana use and driving impairment is complex because of the unique pharmacokinetics, that's the time course in the body, and pharmacodynamics, that's its physiological effects, of THC. With ethanol, there's a clear relationship between amount consumed, blood concentrations, and effect on driving. With marijuana, these types of relationships are much more complex. The relationship between blood THC concentrations and crash risk has not been established. But there is a clear understanding that THC impairs driving performance. The question that remains is how to best identify drivers who are impaired by marijuana. There are no perfect solutions, and legislative directives must balance keeping our roadways safe with due process. Problems with determining the relationship between concentrations of THC and impairment is that levels of THC 
vary widely depending on the route of administration, the time of sampling after dosing, and the characteristics of the individual consuming. Generally, smoked marijuana causes effects that start shortly after inhalation and last for about three hours, while subjects who eat marijuana start feeling effects about an hour later and can have effects up to eight hours later. Unlike alcohol, which is cleared within 24 hours of drinking, THC and several metabolites accumulate in the body with repeated dosing. So frequent users have baseline concentrations of THC that exceed the per se limits in many states. Um, after smoking, THC concentrations in blood change rapidly. And our studies have documented the poor relationship between concentrations of THC and measures of impairment. Studies like this led the National Safety Council to put out a position statement in 2017 that reads, it is further concluded that due to rapid changes in blood THC concentrations over time, there is no minimum safe threshold blood concentration below which a driver can be considered to have been unaffected while driving following recent marijuana use. Consequently, there is no scientific basis for the adoption of THC per se laws for driving. This statement was also supported by the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Despite these position statements, 18 states currently have some form of per se statutes. How do we keep our roads safe? In California, prosecution of driving under the influence of drugs is currently based on officer observations combined with toxicology testing. This practice will likely continue for the foreseeable future. Since there's no reasonable expectation that THC or a metabolite of THC will be useful for per se impairment, an alternative approach would be to develop methods that identify recent use. The biological specimens that could be used to determine if a driver has recently used marijuana are blood, breath, and oral fluid. The primary advantage of breath and oral fluid over blood is that they can be collected at the roadside at the time of a traffic stop, as opposed to blood, which typically takes about 90 minutes to collect. This is an important consideration because unlike ethanol, concentrations of THC fall by more than 90% in that short time frame. There is a variety of ongoing efforts to identify recent use markers. In respect to my time limit, I would like to close my initial statement by mentioning two items that I think this caucus needs to be aware of so they can help shape appropriate regulations. Due to federal restrictions, investigators cannot study the cannabis products our, po our population is exposed to. As Dr. Adams indicated, we've unleashed a massive experiment that's sort of uncontrolled in our population. And our most powerful resources, our research community, has limited ability to study that. This is a critically important public health issue that needs to be changed. Currently, there's no standardized data collection for driving under the influence of drugs. Without good data, it's difficult to develop good policy. I hope my testimony was helpful and look forward to answering questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Gruber. Thank you, Senator Cornyn and Senator Feinstein. Members of the caucus who may tune in later to Could see you this. Speak directly Certainly, is that better? Yeah. I, should, yeah. I should be better at this. So as you've heard and as we know, the nation is in the midst of a green rush and marijuana or cannabis headlines flood news outlets daily. Yet it's often difficult for people to weed through what we study findings and make sense of what we know and what we don't. Despite the fact that 33 states have fully legalized medical marijuana and another 15 have limited medical marijuana laws, leaving only two states without access, nearly all of what we know about the impact of marijuana comes from studies of recreational marijuana users. These studies typically focus on those with chronic heavy marijuana use. Data across studies is somewhat inconsistent but generally reflect differences between those who use marijuana and those who don't, spanning a number of areas that we've heard allusions to already, including cognitive performance. Domains most commonly affected include memory and executive functioning. For example, the ability to inhibit inappropriate responses or to use feedback to change one's behavior. These are reportedly impacted by marijuana use. Uh, 
Earlier onset of marijuana use, as well as higher frequency and magnitude of use, are also associated with greater difficulty on these tasks. And studies of brain structure and function have also reported deficits or differences between marijuana users and non-users, specifically as among early onset or adolescent users of marijuana. This is not surprising. As you heard from Dr. Volkoff, we know that during adolescence, the brain is neurodevelopmentally vulnerable. That is, it's under construction. It's sensitive not just to marijuana, but to other substances, alcohol, illness, injury. Another concern that we've heard a lot about today is the rising potency of marijuana products, particularly problematic for youth, our most vulnerable consumer group. THC, the primary intoxicating con compound of the plant, has increased 300% or more than threefold in flower products since 1995. And these novel concentrate products that we've also heard allusions to, dabs, shatter, wax, you've heard these terms, THC levels of these products go at least up to and sometimes north of 90%. Cannabidiol, or CBD, may mitigate some of the negative effects that we see from THC, but it's virtually undetectable in recreational products today. Thus far, there have been no studies that have directly assessed the impact of potency or novel versus conventional products in either recreational consumers or medical patients. It's also important to remember that not all marijuana use is the same, and our recreational marijuana consumers are not the same as our medical marijuana patients. For example, their goal of use is wholly different. Our recreational marijuana consumers, I've spent nearly 30 years with these folks, their goal is to change their current state of being or to get high. Our medical marijuana patients are not interested in getting high. They use to alleviate symptoms. They say things, I, I want to sleep through the night. I'd like to be able to take a drive with my son. I want to go for a walk with my kids. As a result, their product choices are often different. Recreational consumers often choose products very high in THC. Our medical patients choose products that may be high in THC, but often contain other compounds, things like cannabidiol or other non-intoxicating compounds. Cannabis and cannabinoids have demonstrated therapeutic potential for a number of indications. We heard reference to the 2017 National Academies report noting conclusive or substantial evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids were effective for, quote, the big three, chronic pain, nausea and vomiting as a function of chemotherapy, and muscle spasticity as a function of MS. We also know that Epidiolex, a purified CBD extract, was approved for pediatric onset <coughs> intractable seizure disorders. But despite the fact that medical cannabis has been legal since 1996, data regarding the impact of medical marijuana treatment is severely limited. Preliminary evidence from the very first longitudinal studies of medical marijuana patients demonstrate improvements in some areas of cognitive performance, including areas noted to be impaired in those with recreational use. We also see improvements in clinical state, better sleep, decreased pain, and notable reductions in the use of conventional medications, including opioids, so important in the midst of this crisis. When it comes to marijuana, one size does not fit all. We have a single term, marijuana, and we often hear it used to refer to anything like the whole plant or individual compounds from the plant, intoxicating or not, which mean very different things. Current regulations around marijuana limit the type and scope of research projects we can do. And contrary to popular belief, we cannot currently study the impact of products that patients and consumers are actually using via clinical trial models, significantly reducing external or ecologic validity. Further, as Dr. Volkoff testified, the Schedule I status of marijuana leads to a number of obstacles in conducting research. Policy at this point has clearly outpaced science, and as the nation has warmed toward both the use of medical and recreational marijuana, the need for empirically sound data is critical in order to maximize benefit and reduce harm. Regardless of how you feel about marijuana, science, and not emotion or rhetoric, must be our guide. We have a responsibility to provide the best and most accurate data to our medical marijuana patients, our recreational consumers, our healthcare providers, and the general public, so they can make the best, most informed decisions about marijuana use. At this point, I would thank you for your ongoing efforts and being willing to help move things forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gruber. Dr. Hennessy. Good afternoon, Senators. Uh, my name is Sean Hennessy, and I'm a pharmacist epidemiologist at the University of Pennsylvania. I was a member of the 16-person committee that wrote this 468-page report entitled The Health Effects of Cannabis and Cannabinoids that the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine released in January 2017. The report is a comprehensive review and synthesis of the then existing literature about the potential health effects, both therapeutic and harmful, of cannabis and cannabis-derived products. 
The report lists nearly 100 different conclusions about these effects. It also discusses four barriers to conducting research on cannabis and makes four recommendations on how to address research gaps. I'd like to summarize this report as 644, six health effects with high level evidence, four challenges to conducting research, and four recommendations to moving forward. So among the highest levels of evidence about the health effects of cannabis, uh, we, we uh, made the following conclusions. One, uh, cannabis use prior to driving appears to increase the risk of motor vehicle crashes, as we've heard about today. Two, in states where cannabis is legal, there is an increased risk of unintentional cannabis overdose in children. Three, pregnant women who smoke cannabis increase the risk that their baby will be born with lower birth weight. Four, initiating cannabis use at a younger age is a risk factor for developing problematic cannabis use later in life. Five, Long-term cannabis smoking increases the risk of chronic breathing problems. And six, some people with chronic pain or muscle spasm from multiple sclerosis can obtain relief of their symptoms using cannabis-based products. Most of the studies for these uses examined orally administered cannabis extracts rather than smoked cannabis. The report also identified the following four challenges to conducting research on the health effects of cannabis. One, there are specific regulatory barriers including the classification of cannabis as a Schedule I substance that impede research. Two, it is difficult for researchers to gain access to the quantity, quality, and type of cannabis product that they need to conduct research. Three, it is difficult to obtain funding to support cannabis research. And four, improvement and standardization in research methods are needed. Finally, the report makes the following four recommendations. One, Public health agencies and other groups should fund a national cannabis research agenda. Two, agencies of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services should convene a workshop to develop a set of federal standards and benchmarks to guide high-quality research on cannabis. Three, federal, state, and local health authorities should fund improvements to the public health surveillance system. And four, the CDC, NIH, FDA, and others should convene a committee to characterize regulatory barriers and propose strategies to develop the resources and infrastructure that are needed to conduct cannabis research. I thank you for your attention and the opportunity to discuss these important issues and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Dr. Hennessy. Dr. Meyer. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Senator Feinstein. Could you speak directly into yes. the mic? It's hard to hear. Thank you for inviting me to contribute to my knowledge about cannabis effects on cognitive functioning. The most comprehensive study of cannabis use in cognitive functioning was published by our group in 2012. Today I'm going to describe that 2012 study and explain the findings, why they're important, and what additional research is needed. We studied the association between persistent cannabis use over time and change in IQ from childhood to adulthood. And we asked whether cannabis effects on IQ were concentrated among adolescent onset cannabis users. That is cannabis users who began using before age 18. Data came from the Dunedin study, which is a, a study of 1,000 children born in 1972 and 73 in Dunedin, New Zealand, and followed from birth to age 38, with 96% of the sample taking part in the study at age 38. IQ was tested at age 13, before anybody in the cohort had started using cannabis, and again at age 38, after some members of the cohort had been using cannabis for years. We found that persistent cannabis use from ages 18 to 38 was associated with decline in IQ, and this decline in IQ was concentrated among adolescent onset persistent cannabis users. These are cannabis users who began using cannabis before age 18 and continued using for many years thereafter. Specifically, individuals who began using cannabis in adolescence before age 18 and used it for years showed an average eight point IQ decline from childhood to adulthood. However, Individuals who used cannabis short-term in adolescence showed only weak evidence of IQ decline. Further, individuals who began using cannabis in adulthood sometime after age 18 did not show decline in IQ, even when they used persistently. Quitting or reducing cannabis use did not fully restore intellectual functioning. 
Decline in IQ could not be explained by alcohol or other drug use or by reduced years of education among cannabis users. Decline in IQ could also not be explained by low childhood socioeconomic status or poor childhood self-regulation. Friends and relatives reported noticing more attention and memory problems in everyday life among the persistent cannabis users. These findings are important for a number of reasons. First, an especially important feature of this study is that we had IQ test data from both before and after study members started using cannabis. This allowed us to rule out the possibility that IQ deficits in cannabis users predate the onset of cannabis use. We showed that regardless of their IQ test performance in childhood, adolescent onset persistent cannabis users performed worse than non-users and worse than adult onset cannabis users on IQ tests in adulthood. Second, the eight-point IQ decline we observed among cannabis users who began using cannabis in adolescence and continued using for many years is non-trivial. For example, an average person has an IQ of 100, placing them in the 50th percentile for intelligence compared to same-age peers. If this average person loses eight IQ points, they drop from the 50th to the 29th percentile for intelligence. Third, IQ is a predictor of a person's access to a college education, their lifelong total income, their access to a good job, and their performance on the job. Individuals who lose eight IQ points may be disadvantaged relative to their same age peers in many important aspects of life. In fact, the adolescent onset persistent cannabis users from our 2012 study ended up in occupations that were less prestigious, less skilled, and less well paid than their parents' occupations. Finally, only about 2% of the sample became those adolescent onset persistent cannabis users. Thus, any effect of cannabis on IQ is confined to a relatively small segment of the population. Nonetheless, findings are concerning given that fewer adolescents today believe that regular cannabis use presents a serious health risk. Additional research is needed to answer the following questions. One, what are the mechanisms underlying cannabis-related IQ decline? Two, what are the parameters of cannabis use that determine the magnitude and persistence of cognitive deficits? These are things like frequency, duration, quantity of use, and potency. Three, does cognitive functioning recover with abstinence? Four, are there individual differences in susceptibility to cannabis-related cognitive deficits? To answer these questions, we need large-scale longitudinal studies to follow youth from before to well after cannabis initiation and to combine cognitive testing with brain imaging to better understand the mechanisms that might underlie cannabis-related decline in IQ. The Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study was launched in part to meet this need. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. Welcome, uh, Senator Rosen. Thank you for joining us. And uh, let me start with a five-minute round of questioning. Dr. Gruber, just a point of clarification, we heard from the previous panel that THC concentrations in recreational marijuana have uh, at least tripled, but I see in your paper you, you say that you believe that it's quadrupled um, from uh, 1995 to 2017. Is that correct? I think the prior panel referenced a paper that was published Louder, in 20... please. I'm sorry. Sure. Is that better? I think the prior panel referenced a publication from 2014. Oh, at that, okay. At that time, the difference from 95 to 2014 um, was, was about three times. Three times. Right now, the average potency across the nation from government-seized products is about 17%. That's contrasted to about just under 4% in, in 1995. Okay. So um, that's significant. It's... Uh, you think the best information is it's quadrupled in I, concentration? I would say in terms of national averages for THC, that's, that's right. But for rec Those were recreational products. But you also point out, and this is really the point I wanted to get to, is that there are concentrates, uh, other products that are, have been created. You mentioned things like uh, DABs, the colloquial name for concentrated oil, created by extracting THC from flower-based marijuana products. Shatter, wax, butter, and others all have a significantly higher concentration uh, potency uh, uh, compared to conventional marijuana products, as high as 80% more higher. concentrated. Is that correct? Or higher. Absolutely right. 
This is the, the recreational market uh, is, is very focused on increased THC because if the goal of use is to become intoxicated or to change your current state of being, you're looking for products that will deliver that bigger bang for the buck, if you will. So these products are very, very popular and becoming more popular across the nation from in the recreational market. Well, it strikes me as significant. If you smoke it, it's uh, about four times more powerful than it was uh, in uh, 1995, but you can take it in a concentrated form that could be 80% um, of um, traditional marijuana uh, product. Exactly. THC is significantly higher, as we heard from our first panel, significantly higher these days than in prior years. Well, I can imagine just from a scientific standpoint trying to figure out what the dosing is and what the effect of a dose is very difficult given the uh, range of ways that people can get access to the active ingredient. Um, Mode of use is very important in terms of onset of effects and duration of effects, absolutely true, especially, in our, especially important for our medical cannabis patients. The, um, Dr. Fitzgerald, you've done uh, a lot of work, you said, in terms of its impact on impaired drivers. Um, and uh, would it be fair to say that the concentration of THC and whether it's uh, consumed from uh, recreational use of smoking marijuana compared to these concentrates, does it have a, have a uh, is there a correlation between the concentration of the product that you consume and the level of impairment for drivers? So, so that, I think that that's one of the issues that, that uh, Dr. Adams brought up as well, is that we, we haven't even been able to study the dabs and the concentrates. It's, it's not possible to do those studies currently. Um, well, those aren't standardized products. And I mean, like you would be able to, you can't compare widgets to widgets, I guess. Correct. Because and, and, they're all sort of, um, concocted by whoever makes them according so, to their own recipe and the like. Several issues there. One, yeah. we don't know what is actually in those. They're labeled. Um, California actually does have a, a reasonably good uh, laboratory system for analyzing plant materials as well as dabs and things for pesticides and concentrations of THC. Mm -hmm. um, but that's only in the legal market, and the legal market, unfortunately, is a small share of the total market of, of recreational marijuana. As we know, there's, uh, there's been an unfortunate increase in suicides in the country. Um, a lot of concerns about our veterans in particular, but not just veterans, it's just young people and others who end up taking their life. I wonder, do you find any correlation between self-medication um, of people with underlying mental health disorders that get exacerbated by the use of, uh, of marijuana or some of these concentrated products? I don't know who would be the most appropriate person to ask. If you have an opinion, please jump in. I have, a, I have an opinion since I work in a psychiatric hospital and been seeing these patients for about 30 years. Sounds to me like you're qualified. Maybe, maybe I don't know. That's, that's under debate. Uh, I can tell you that there are many, many patient populations that derive real benefit from using, using cannabis or cannabinoid-based products. And the potential risk for individuals with undiagnosed conditions or disorders, you know, where we hear about these individuals who are using and not necessarily disclosing or they're self-medicating, one of the important things to, to, to be mindful of is that it's not necessarily the cannabis, but we have to be mindful of what's driving the cannabis use. Individuals who have different types of conditions often, as I mentioned, um, get benefit from use, but it's very, very important to watch these people, one, over time, and to look at the impact versus, you know, sort of a cross-sectional assessment in a longitudinal fashion. No doubt some individuals with different conditions have their conditions exacerbated by cannabis use. That's why it's so important to be able to identify the most likely compounds from the plant, which may make things worse, versus those which may make things better. In fact, there's evidence to suggest some compounds from the plant may actually really positively impact some of these conditions that we see, and this is why so many people are turning toward them, but without real empirically sound data to guide these types of studies, we have limited ability to, to, to give them information. Well, my understanding, my layman's understanding is that there's, uh, there's some evidence that epilepsy can be uh, treated using uh, THC-related uh, products, 
But uh, can, can have a dial. Okay. Is there any? What other benefits have you been able to identify based at least on anecdotal information in the absence of these longitudinal studies? What other benefits? do you suspect may be derived from, from use of marijuana? So from diff different compounds from the plant may very well have individualized benefits. We know about cannabidiol. I think this is mentioned in your, in your bill. Um, cannabidiol has been shown to potentially be efficacious not just for epilepsy, which is now approved by the FDA. Epidiol sits in Schedule 5. Um, but for other conditions, uh, there have been some interesting studies, including preclinical work in areas like anxiety. A number of different conditions may be positively impacted by cannabidiol. Other compounds may yield, again, therapeutic potential, but we don't have much in the way of long-term studies. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to study these compounds using clinical trial models, sort of the gold standard for deriving empirically sound data, given our current restrictions. We have an ongoing, we just started a long-term clinical trial, open label to double blind, of a whole plant full spectrum product for patients with anxiety. This data will be very, very important. Uh, since so many people turn to things like CBD and they say it's good for this, it's good for this, it would be great to have empirically sound data to lean on to actually guide patients and caregivers. I even have a friend who said they put CBD uh, product in their pet food. Sure. So their pet relieves yeah. their pet of anxiety. So I guess it cures everything. The, I don't know about everything, but there's some data from studies outside of this country, small studies, in terms of cannabidiol's impact on anxiety, some preclinical work, and finally some work here. So it certainly begs the question of how much more we need, which in my opinion is a lot more. But we're starting. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Feinstein. Senator <laughs> Feinstein. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 33 states and the District of Columbia have legalized marijuana in some form, and each state <clears throat> excuse me, has its own laws and regulations. Should we be concerned that the lack of uniformity across states in terms of testing, labeling, packaging, the strength of products that may be sold, how they may be advertised, and how they may be accessed can lead to consumer confusion? And this could produce unintended acute public health effects, including increased emergency room visits. In Colorado, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> there was a threefold increase in marijuana related emergency room visits between 2012 and 2016. So here's the question Would uniform regulations across states be helpful? to ensure consumer safety and reduce public health impacts, such as emergency room visits associated with marijuana use. Who would like to go? Why don't we just go right down the line? If you have a comment, make it. If you don't, you don't. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, I think California is, is a model there for the, the fact that all the um, state approved marijuana has actually been through a, a very sophisticated testing scheme to show its purity, show that it doesn't have pesticides, show it doesn't have fungus um, and those things. Um, there is some question about the reliability of different laboratories and it would be nice to have a reference laboratory that everyone else sort of standardizes against. That would be useful to have uniform labeling and, and certainly the uh, the CDC can be helpful in that regard. Thank you. I think it's incredibly important uh, to have uniformity, and I think I'm it's, having trouble hearing you. I think it's incredibly important to have uniformity, and more, even more important, to have full disclosure of quote what's in your wheat. People have no idea very often what they're getting, and so I think it's incredibly important since states make their own uh, sort of their own rules and regulations about what's allowed. In my state of Massachusetts, and I spend a lot of time in California as well. These things are clearly defined in terms of testing for aflatoxins, heavy metals, pesticides, contaminants, yeast, mold. So a critical. standard across the United States would be helpful. I think having a reference standard would be incredibly important and making sure every state does thorough testing is critical. Thank you. I agree and don't have anything to add. Thank you. I agree as well and don't have anything additional to add. Okay. Um, What is the most common form of marijuana concentrate being used by adolescents, and how much THC does it contain? This is my, adolescent use is my big concern. 
My group just published, I believe, the first epidemiological study of that. And uh, we found that you can talk about concentrates as a general class, but there's two really different types of concentrates. One that's extracted using a solvent like butane, and those tends to have generally higher concentrations than the other class of concentrates where the THC is extracted using kind of ice or um, just rubbing it. And that has still much higher THC content than, for example, marijuana, which is the buds of the cannabis plant. Um, and then adolescents are using all of that, but pr primarily they're using the solvent extracted. They're using a what? The solvent extracted concentrates. Which what go is by, that? Which I... go by names, a various <clears throat> names. Dabs is a generic name to refer to just taking a very small kind of waxy piece of the concentrate. Um, but then there's butane hash oil, or they call it BHO, and it's called that because you extract the concentrate with butane solvent. Um, it's also mm. called honey, uh, honey oil, crumble, um, lots of different names for it. And while those products look different, right? One can look like a waxy, sticky substance. One can look like butter. They all contain similarly high levels of THC. Aha. Uh -huh. So are they heavily used by adolescents? We know from the state of Arizona, one in four adolescents have said they've tried concentrates. So what would you suggest we do, we do, if anything? I think we need, my primary concern is educating parents and people like you to recognize what a concentrate is. It does not look like marijuana. It looks very different. And recognizing that that contains very high levels of THC, which could pose risks to health. Well, would you have a standard for this? Does that make sense? Or should government get involved in this? I think, you know, when you talk about adolescents, you don't want them to die, and you don't want them to become addicted. Correct. We don't want them to become addicted, but we still need to do research on whether adolescents who use concentrates are more likely to become addicted than if they use the lower THC marijuana. So I think we need more research because some evidence suggests that it's possible that these concentrates will not have ill effects if adolescents are titrating their use, which means using less when the THC content is high. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Rosen. <clears throat> well, thank you. I want to uh, thank Chairman Corn and Ranking Member Feinstein for holding this important hearing. I want to thank all of you for your years of school and research and dedication to this um, extremely important topic. I want to talk a little bit about mar medical marijuana. Although marijuana is legal in Nevada for both uh, medicine and recreational purposes, um, the research that you're doing is so important for my state's hospitals, providers, schools, parents, law enforcement agencies, anybody that's concerned with the public health impact. And there are approximately, in Nevada, about 17,000 uh, medical marijuana patients. So this research that you do really impacts their lives and their ability to seek treatment for their medical conditions. And so with that in mind, I really appreciate the bipartisan approach which has led to this hearing. And I hope the conversation um, will continue to be research and science-based. It's so important that we have uh, these longitudinal studies, epidemiological studies, so on and so forth. It makes a real difference as to how our communities can educate and legislate if we need to, to do the right thing. But I want to talk about the potential benefits of medical cannabis in treating our nation's veterans. We have over 220,000 veterans in Nevada, and let me tell you, I don't have to tell you how much they do struggle. They struggle with chronic pain, they struggle with depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress symptoms, and in too many cases, they're becoming addicted to medications prescribed to them opioids, other things like that. Our veterans, they have given so much to their country. They just want to come back. They want to claim their lives and continue to serve their communities in whatever way um, is good for them and their families. And so VA providers are currently prohibited from recommending or prescribing cannabis use. The VA uh, won't reimburse veterans for medical marijuana prescriptions from any source. 
Um, former VA Secretary David Shulkin, he stated last week he believes the VA should be involved in research on anything that could potentially help veterans and their well-being. So to Dr. Hennessy and then anyone else after, uh, you were a member of a committee that conducted a rigorous overview of available research on the potential health benefits of cannabis or therapeutic benefits. Um, it also identifies barriers to research. You made recommendations. So I would really appreciate your thoughts of how we might use cannabis to help our veterans uh, through anxiety and depression in, in those ways and, and find alternatives to treat the issues that they are suffering from when they come home. So thank you for your question, Senator. <clears throat> so of the uses that you mentioned, there, um, there's randomized trial data um, supporting the use of uh, cannabis products for chronic pain. <clears throat> and the cannabis products that were studied most often for chronic pain was an oral solution of one-to-one -one THC to CBD. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't um, either smoked or vaped cannabis. The other indications that, that you mentioned, anxiety, depression, PTSD, there are not good data from randomized trials that support uh, the efficacy of um, uh, either whole cannabis or uh, cannabis-derived products uh, for those indications. Um, lack of evidence doesn't mean that the products aren't, that uh, none of the constituents of cannabis aren't effective. Um, and in some cases, it merely means that the studies haven't been conducted or not enough of them have been conducted to identify a beneficial effect if there is one. So you would support us funding or lifting the ban on some of the research to find out if we can um, use these products effectively, Dr. Gruber? Yes, um, and, and thank you so much for focusing on this issue. We have a program through the MIND, the MIND program called Serving Those Who Have Served, and it's dedicated to our veterans yeah. because so many are already using cannabis or cannabinoids for treatment. Mm -hmm. Many are interested in using it, but we have right. no real data. Right. So, you know, we come at this at a, as a quasi-clinical uh, trial because we can't administer products that are in the marketplace. Right given our current federal regulations and restrictions. So we do the best that we can, but we follow these folks over time, longitudinally. Mm -hmm. And we need more data like that to be able to really understand the impact. As, as referred to by Dr. Hennessy, we don't have a ton of data, but certainly lifting anything that would allow greater research efforts to be made, would I would be in favor of. Well, thank you. I want to, um, uh, you spoke about chronic pain and I was, uh, um, fortunate enough to be able to start the Comprehensive Care Caucus, which is focusing on palliative care, people living with a terminal illness or chronic disease, and they need palliative care, although they may not be getting curative care. And so, um, can you speak to the effects of you, how we could use cannabis in a palliative care spectrum for those, like I said, living with chronic disease or living longer with terminal illness to uh, relieve some of the symptoms uh, that they may be having as a result of their uh, disease? Sure. So um, one of the symptoms that, um, that patients in palliative care experience is chronic pain. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as I mentioned, uh, there are um, clinical trials showing that uh, oral solutions of uh, cannabis extract uh, are, um, are effective for chronic pain. Um, in terms of other, um, other indications for use in the palliative care setting, um, I think uh, more research is needed to be able to, to recommend them as effective therapies. We, we don't want to recommend therapies and um, offer false hope to people right. uh, for therapies that end up not being effective uh, that, in addition, have side effects on their own. Right. Thank you. I think it's also important to just to dovetail on what Dr. Hennessy is saying, to be able to assess the actual products that patients are using, as right. opposed to just sort of guessing. And the one-to-one -one ratios of oral solutions, things like Sativex, um, are not necessarily in the marketplace for our palliative care patients. Um, our ongoing longitudinal study at the MIND program actually follows patients with chronic pain as a subgroup, and they demonstrate improvements over time using lots of different products. But this research is really in its infancy, and this is, as far as I know, the only longitudinal study like this in the country. Right. We need a lot more. Well, I applaud all of your work, and I do think that um, particularly in the medical space, trying to find the ways that we can um, use marijuana to whether make chronic pain, anxiety, terminal disease, PTSD, depression, if we can find ways that make people uh, help them 
go better uh, through uh, better through their lives, then uh, it is definitely worth worth researching. And I appreciate your hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Dr. Gruber, I think um, I think I understand what you were telling me earlier. Let me just confirm I got this right. There's a part of marijuana that will make you high. That's THC, right? It's the yes. active ingredient? That's the primary psychoactive compound in the plant, yes. Okay, that's a more eloquent way of saying okay. it than I do. All right. And then there are other products from the marijuana plant or that can be derived from that, like CBD, that you may think that you think has some medicinal or beneficial effects, but that, that has little or no THC in it, correct? Correct. Just to clarify really quick and dirty, uh, cannabis sativa L, the plant, uh, is comprised of hundreds of compounds. The primary psychoactive thing, uh, c compound is THC, that gets you high. The primary non-intoxicating constituent is cannabidiol, shown to have tremendous, at least thought to have tremendous therapeutic benefit. There are many, many other cannabinoids, cannabichromine, cannabigerol, tetrahydrocannabivarin, as well as terpenoids, the essential oils that give cannabis its characteristic scent and flavor profile that have also been touted to have potential beneficial effects. Flavonoids. The plant is incredibly complex. It's not just THC and CBD, although I know that's where we start our discussions, but it's important to remember that alongside THC, we have CBD and other players. Would it be possible for Congress to deschedule or to treat uh, CBD and other non-THC products differently than it would um, THC or psychoactive components of the plant? As I understand it, currently under the Controlled Substance Act, anything that comes from the plant cannabis sativa with greater than 0.3% THC by weight falls under Schedule 1. Anything that comes from so termed industrial hemp, legalized in the 2018 Farm Bill or Hemp Bill, um, those, CBD from, from that source is legal. Um, so that's descheduled. So, so Congress has already carved out an exception, basically, for hemp. For industrial hemp-derived CBD, ostensibly the DEA will allow those types of, let's say, research studies to move forward. And what differentiates those two is one is has a next to, or negligible, if any, THC Industrial. component, and, the, and the, the other product that um, is a psychoactive one has the THC uh, much, at much more concentrated levels. Much right? more concentrated levels. Both plants have THC. Industrial hemp maxes out, by definition, as 0.3% THC by weight. Cannabis sativa L, when we think of marijuana, we think of that plant that can be bred to have very, very high levels of THC, um, as well as levels of other, other cannabinoids. There are differences in, in the two cultivars. Well, that's, that's helpful. Um, thank you very much. Certainly. Senator Rosen, do you have anything else you'd like to ask? Well, let me express my gratitude to uh, each of you and our previous panel of witnesses. Uh, this is a conversation we should have started a long time ago. Uh, but I'm glad at least we're starting it now. And uh, as you can tell, there's a lot of uh, lot we have to learn, members of Congress, the policymakers, but I think the American people, um, I think the, the risks, the health risks of marijuana use have been undersold. And uh, uh, as we heard from the previous panel, and but yet there are uh, beneficial uses uh, that don't involve the psychoactive component we've heard that uh, could be enormously helpful, and uh, uh, so this has been very, uh, very uh, informative, so I thank you for it. Thank you for your participation. We're going to cl close the hearing now, but we'll leave the record open for another week uh, in case any member of the caucus has written questions they would like to ask uh, to follow on. Uh, but uh, taking Senator Feinstein up on her suggestion, it may be that uh, the caucus would decide to publish a white paper on what we've learned here, perhaps for the benefit of others, including policymakers like ourselves. And uh, that's something we're going to look into uh, as well. So we look forward to continuing the conversation with you. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.